Welcome to Native Instruments 105, Introduction to Contact. Contact is the sampler of choice for composers, sound designers, and producers. It's been part of my arsenal since version one came out many years ago. In this course, I'm going to give you a nice overview of everything you need to know to play with Contact. If you're new to sampling, let me give you a brief introduction. A sampler is a hardware or software device that plays back recordings when you trigger it using a keyboard or other device. One of the first samplers was the Mellotron. It would play back loops of pre-recorded sound. The loop could play for about seven seconds, and then it would rewind to the beginning and start over again. The Mellotron was heavy and it would easily go out of tune. The tape loops would wow and flutter, but none of these problems kept it from being a staple of late 60s rock. If you want to hear the most famous Mellotron recording, pull out your copy of the Beatles' Strawberry Fields Forever. The flute intro? It's a Mellotron. During the 70s, a wide range of sampling synthesizers came into being, such as the Fairlight. Instead of relying on pre-recorded tapes, the Fairlight allowed musicians to draw sound waves on the screen, which the computer would turn into sound. You could then tweak the waves to create entirely new sounds. The Synclavier was one of the first synthesizers to integrate digital technology. It used FM synthesis as well as sampling to create sounds, and they only cost a few hundred thousand dollars. In the 80s, a company called Emu introduced a range of synthesizers called emulators. Emulators were among the first sampling instruments to be used by a wide range of musicians due to its relatively low price and its size. You could load sounds into the emulator using five and a quarter floppy disks, and you could share those sounds with other emulator users. Stevie Wonder received the first emulator. The 80s also brought us the first Akai samplers. Akai samplers improved the polyphony and the sample length of previous samplers. They were also more affordable than anything that had come previously. For this reason, they found their way into many studios. Their most popular sampler, the S1000, featured up to 16 voices and 32 megabytes of memory. Megabytes, not gigabytes. Now each of these samplers offered something more than just playing back pre-recorded sounds. With the samplers, one could manipulate the sounds, add effects, change the pitch, reverse the sound, and use many other techniques. Over time, as computers became more powerful, we saw the first software samplers. Products like Giga Sampler, later called Giga Studio, became staples in music studios. Unlike hardware samplers, where you had to load in banks of sounds from disks as you needed them, software samplers allowed you to access any sound that you had on your disk, and they could play much larger and more complex sounds. This made it easier to access large libraries of sounds. And they didn't have to be your own sounds. Many vendors produced libraries of sounds that you could load into your samplers. Some of these were samples of real instruments, such as strings and percussion. Others were weird soundscapes, loops, and other unnatural sounds. When MIDI came about in the 80s, most samplers began to support it. This meant that you could use an external keyboard to send MIDI notes to a sampler. You could also send other information such as pitch band, mod wheel, breath control, and so forth to alter the sample playback. Later on, we had the birth of software plugins, which allowed users to access the sampler from within their sequencers, like Pro Tools or Cubase or Logic. Now, every sampler has its own bells and whistles, but there are a few things that no decent sampler could leave out. One of these is velocity switching. This means that you can assign different samples to playback based on how hard you hit a key. For example, if you play a note softly, it may trigger one sound. If you play it medium velocity or medium strength, it would trigger a different sound. And if you play it really hard, it would trigger a third sound. In addition to velocity switching, most samplers support key switching. This allows a different bank of sounds to be triggered by playing a special note on the keyboard or hitting a button on a MIDI controller. For example, if I play the lowest C on my keyboard, C0, I might get a sustained string sound. But if I then play an F, I would then get a pizzicato sound. The German company Native Instruments unveiled the first version of Contact in 2002, and they've steadily enhanced it since then. The capabilities it has to handle enormous libraries of sounds and to manipulate those sounds is a far cry from the early days of sampling. 
In contact, there are literally hundreds of things that you can do to change the way your sounds and samples play back. One of the things that's so nice about contact is that it takes the most common ways you may want to alter your sound and gives you easy access to those controls. If you want to dive under the covers, you can, but you don't have to. In the next video, we'll start taking a closer look at contact, and I'll showcase some of the features that we'll cover later in the course.